welcome everyone. Good afternoon to uh, Europe. Good morning to the United States. My name is Fernando Ortiz Eman. I am the Chief Strategy Officer at Safran. And I'm very happy to invite you all in uh, to the next hour where we'll be discussing culture and EVP with two amazing guests that I'll introduce right after I talk a little bit just for a few seconds on the housekeeping of the day, just that this session is actually being recorded. So I just wanted to mention that and how we envision the next hour to work. Uh, we will have the chat with both Sue and Marco for around 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A, which hopefully uh, should uh, derive in some very interesting questions. Having said that, it's now very quickly time to make some introductions. I'll start with Sue. Sue Davis is Chief Human Resource Officer for Markel. She's based out of uh, Richmond, which is the global headquarters for Markel, Richmond, Virginia, United States. Uh, Sue actually joined Markel in 2016. And prior to that, uh, she led the talent management team at CarMax. Uh, and before that, work for Midwest Vacu, which is now Westrock in a range of global HR strategy and marketing roles based both in Europe and the US. And in her earlier career, uh, she spent a wide variety of global HR roles at AstraZeneca. So uh, welcome, Sue. It's a, a pleasure to have you. Uh, and just if, you. I, if I can add uh, my personal uh, touch to it, because I mean, I've had the pleasure already working with you. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing how Sue actually uh, connects with the entire organization, uh, with everyone, the empathy and the closeness she creates with everyone uh, within Markel. So it's it's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Very quickly as to Markel. Mar Markel is a global special insured headquartered, as I mentioned, Richmond, Virginia, USA. Fortune 500 company holding 76 offices in 18 countries offers a broad array of tools to address clients, insurance coverage needs, community insurance, insurance link securities, and fronting. So just to get a picture of uh, the scope we're discussing here as to Markel. Um, Marco um, is the Chief People and Culture Officer at Galp. Um, before joining Galp, which is actually not long ago, I mean, you just joined a few months back, right, over exactly. the summer. Um, you came from uh, Bonn, Germany, where you were actually the VP of HR Europe for no one less than Deutsche Telekom. Uh, quite a, a bear moth in the telco space worldwide. And, and before that, you held different HR roles in both Vodafone and Nokia. So very much welcome. My experience with Marco uh, is rather limited, but one thing uh, I have already noticed with Marco, it's definitely that next generation of HR leaders with very fresh, innovative ideas, uh, bringing it uh, to the corporate world. So it's uh, very refreshing to have you with us. Gulp, uh, just to uh, very quickly describe and give you a little bit of an idea of what Gulp is. Portuguese multinational energy corporation headquartered in Lisbon, Portugal, present in 10 countries, several continents, more than 100 companies uh, within the Gulp ecosystem engage in every aspect of what nowadays you would call uh, energy, both fossil-based fuels and also renewables. Um, very exciting moment for that industry in such a transition. So thanks so much for being with us here, Marco, today. Great. All Thank right. Thank you for having well, me. Now that we um that we started, we I, I I thought probably the very first question also for all our listeners that might be interesting is that I mean both of you already had uh, very long-standing successful careers in HR and you've worked with very impressive organizations in different regions and different geographies, um, and maybe this question is a little bit broad, but let me start like with that: What makes nowadays for a great working culture? So, yeah, I think, I mean, a great culture, um, Fernando, for me, um, and delighted to be here with everyone today. Thank you for the, thank you for the invite. Um, I think, you know, a great culture, one where really um, there are shared vision and values um, in the organization. I think that's absolutely critical. And um, we're lucky at Markel that um, 
way back in the, the 1980s, um, we actually spent some time, the, the individuals who were in the organization leadership at that time spent some time putting together, and I'm going to mention it just because I might come back to it a few times, but the Markel style, and that really is um, a, a little bit of a sort of manifesto about who we are, how we how we operate. Um, it doesn't actually say anything about insurance or financial services, but it really talks about the kind of organization we want to be from an um, employee, community, um, uh, customer, stakeholder perspective. So we've kind of, you know, continue to use that as our sort of North Star for all things when it comes to culture. And I think that's really, really important that we have that to kind of um, tie into. And then I think, you know, you overlay on that, obviously, the last few years and everything that we've all experienced, I think, you know, um, flexibility has definitely become a, a much more important part of the, the culture. Um, I think continuing to make sure that we are listening. I mean, we talk a lot about voice of employee as well as voice of customer. Um, and so making sure that we are really listening, connecting um, and really supporting, I think, individuals in everything that they are doing and, and keeping people connected to their teams, um, to the company, even though they might be, um, you know, here, there and everywhere kind of thing. So I think that's a that's a key part of culture as well. Um, couple of other things I'd probably throw in there. I think, you know, the ability of our managers um, to create a really strong culture. Uh, I think that manager capability, we've spent quite a lot of time over the last few years helping managers to work out how do you do that in a hybrid working situation. So I think that's, um, that's an important part. And then purpose, um, purpose for us and purpose that goes beyond um, the company and beyond, you know, uh, profit, uh, but thinking about purpose when it talks about community when it talks about individual potential so I think really helping folks um, take on that that broader sense of what our culture is how our culture really connects the organization so a few thoughts there for you well, quite a lot of things that got you busy huh? that uh, makes it uh, rather challenging <laughs> how how does that work out uh, for you mark what would you define as a great working culture nowadays and how does that build upon or compare to what sue just has described before i'll actually pick up in the last thing that that sue said around purpose because i think for us we're still in uh, in a process of transformation in terms of our culture so last year we launched a new purpose, which is to graduate the future together, which is very aligned with the you know, energy transition that we're going through as a company, you know, the society is going through. So we launched that new purpose and uh, linked to it a few strategic pillars that I think are fundamental to the culture that we are building now. And, and one thing that I think is really important about it, and I think it translates to you know, the kind of culture that we would like to create is that it's really centered on our people. So one of those three strategic pillars is to re-energize our people. Uh, I think that that speaks a lot about the ambition of the company in terms of its transformation. The other two are linked to the portfolio of, you know, moving more towards renewables and obviously having less dependence on, on fossil fuels and, and reshaping kind of relationships, you know, refreshing the relationships we have with society because sometimes when you're an energy company it's a little bit challenging, you know, especially nowadays when, you know, the price of up. energy, oh, well, there's, you have to really have a strong purpose. And I think ours is, is a strong and then, then you need to, to connect that with everything you do across your organization. And I think they will play a, a key role as the people team and as we translate that into what we call a, a human-centered culture. We really focus on, on the employees uh, and their journey on the company and how we can help amplify the purpose of regenerating the future. So I think I, I could speak here about some of the things. I think Sue mentioned leadership as well. That, that's a big priority for us. We really need to do much more in that front, but it's a transformation process that really touches multiple levels uh, across, I would say, the, the company or the employee life cycle. Mm -hmm. Wow. Again, lots of things. And uh, obviously, at some point now, I needed to also ask, how have you seen this evolving over time? I mean, obviously, and I can imagine, maybe let allow me to throw in something like the pandemic, right? Obviously, there has been a change happening there. Um, uh, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is the pandemic might have influenced this, uh, this evolution. Is, is that like the, was that the, the, the big parameter or have there been other factors of uh, where you have noticed over uh, the past uh, decade or not, um, the uh, 
uh, an evolution to it, you know, be it uh, generational, is it, it, does it really make a difference as you might have seen that the interests of the actual workforce is different or they prioritize on different things. How have you seen this evolution over the past year or even decade? So, do you want me to jump in? Yeah, sure. yeah, <laughs> Happy <sorry. to. laughs> yeah I, I think the generational piece, Fernando, is, is, is really interesting because I think, you know, a lot has been obviously written about that. Um, and I think there are some shifts. Um, I think something like the pandemic, though, to be honest, probably shifted everybody almost like irrespective of, of generation. I think, you know, we just saw a real change in employees' expectations. Um, and I think, you know, that's something, as I say, when you think about um, flexibility, when you think about working in different locations, you think about hybrid and how that's playing out. Um, I think those, those are things that probably have, um, you know, it's almost whatever generation that has really had an impact. Um, I think there are some things as, as you think about um, the different generations. We, we've actually spent quite a bit of time doing some almost like generational um, training so you, you put people from different generations together um, in a training program and they all kind of talk about some of the influences on, you know, how, what they, um, what influenced them growing up, um, the different kind of pieces in the world history sort of thing. It's fascinating because it really, I think, ends up with everybody realizing, wow, everybody brings something unique and different. And it's almost got a, that DNI angle to it as well. And I think, you know, it does help some of the, intergenerational understanding as well which uh, you know we all know sometimes there can there can be um issues in terms of that but um yeah and then i do think that there are things that just um override whatever generation i mean i think you know purpose that marco just kind of you know uh, double clicked on that i think that's really critical i think just being part of a winning team and having a a strong culture that again is inclusive and make sure that people whatever their generation really do feel connected um, to the culture connected to the purpose of the organization so i think you've got to be aware of differences but i think also not to um over exaggerate them mm -hmm. I mean, just before I turn over to Marcus, it's interesting you may mention this idea of generational training. Is that, I guess that was something that wasn't there before. Is that something that has been actually rather been introduced over the past few years? Or is that something that has accompanied you throughout your careers? These sorts of needs to be more um, sensitive to the different generations, even from a DNI perspective. I think it's um, certainly for me, I mean, I've seen more of that probably over the last, we were doing that training before the pandemic, but I think probably the last, five or six years, um, certainly it's something that we introduced fairly early when I came into Markel, just seeing, I mean, we have got a very um, wide you know, generational range and just something that's uh, has been really helpful and people who've been through it love it. Mm, super. Uh, Mark, over to you. How have you seen this uh, evolution happening over the past years or even decades? Yeah, I think there's been an acceleration. Um, I think, you know, with the pandemic situation, it definitely accelerated certain things. It accelerated technology and the ability for people to kind of be connected from home. And I think that that kind of changed that big, you know, belief that, that people could only be effective at work if they were working from the office. And I think that was a, definitely a big accelerator. I think there's also been an acceleration in terms of DNI, you know, in terms of allowing people to bring uh, their best selves to work and kind of respecting those differences and creating the conditions for all to kind of be successful within the organization. I think people look more at that right now. I think the new generations definitely look into that with a different lenses, maybe as, as the, the previous ones, because the world has also changed. And I think, you know, when you look at those kind of transformations, I think it kind of challenges companies to think differently and to be able to, you know, to position themselves and creating conditions sometimes a little bit, um, you know, in a different way as well. I also think that, especially when I look at Generation Z, Z or Z, as, as you want to call it, that they're looking more into connecting with the purpose of the organization. I think mm -hmm. the needs have changed, you know, obviously society has evolved and the new generations, they, they have, they start at an advantage point, they don't have to go through you know, in many countries through the same challenges that the prior ones had to go through. So now they're looking really to connecting with the purpose of the organization and doing meaningful work that connects with their values. So I think that's challenging. And, you know, I mentioned before the fact that energy companies are quite hated these days and there's been 
a few you know manifestations and stuff here in Portugal uh, in terms of climate change and and I think you have to a lot of the talent pool is going to come from from that generation so that that challenges us to to change and also to position ourselves in a different way to the outside world I mean, it's interesting because we've been now describing a, a, a set of different challenges and, and from many different uh, viewpoints that actually you face on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I really added this question because I think for many of our listeners and viewers, it might be especially interesting just to better understand. I mean, when you are now, I know that both of you are now in the office or, or at work right now, but tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., you know, what what... What really makes it really challenging? I mean, you guys really have a tough job. I mean, if you think about the organizations from a from a, from an employee perspective, from a staff perspective, all the things that we've been discussing so far, all what's happening, especially in your industries, right? I mean, you know, at Gulp, energy transition. I mean, you're in the midst of the storm, suit and insurance, which I mean, we all know that, right? I mean, historically, it's always like, oh my God, insurance, oh. From a tantra attraction perspective, it's maybe something boring, which I, the first one who understands that that's definitely not true. It's a fascinating industry. So I actually advocate you for everyone to be excited, maybe potentially to work in insurance. But bottom line is that, I mean, if you come to work tomorrow morning, eight o'clock in the morning, what what are your greatest challenges that you face facing that day? You know, what's on your desk happening now? I think that might be just really interesting for our listeners just to get a better understanding for that. So, yeah, I'm happy. Happy to jump in, Fernando, on that one. Um, and I, th I think, you know, it was interesting you started the call with culture, because I would say, you know, for, for me, for Markel, for us, it is really critical that kind of um, protecting and nurturing a strong culture um, is absolutely critical. And I think it's particularly critical because it then impacts some of those key, key challenges. I mean, I think when you think about attraction, retention, I mean, the great war for talent we're certainly not seeing that going away. Um, you know, we've been, I think, um, just on the insurance side of Markel, you know, over 1,100, uh, and that's about a 5,000 person business. Um, you know, we are growing fast. So continuing to attract um, great talent is really important. I think, yeah, over 1,100 folks new to Markel. Um, and so for me, a key piece is making sure that as we bring new employees into the company, we really help them um, you know, be successful and get embedded into the culture. And I think that was a challenge, um, even in hybrid, um, but certainly when we were remote, you know, how do you, how do you build those connections that used to happen probably more just, um, you know, you, you just expect it to happen. I think we're having to be a lot more thoughtful about that. So I think, you know, keeping that and then from a retention perspective as well, I think that's key. And then probably two other things. I mean, well-being, uh, I think, you know, continuing to keep a real focus on that I think the you know not long not long COVID but the long tail of COVID I think continues to be um, an issue and that you know people are exhausted and um, I think you know making sure that we just really think about that from a um, you know, bandwidth uh, are people taking leave are we doing the right things for folks um, so I, I think that's just a, an ongoing one that keeps me doesn't really I don't I don't stay awake too much at night but that's one that <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe wakes me up in the morning um, and then total rewards as well I mean I think you know you, you're blind not to think about what's going on from an inflationary pressure um, some of those issues and so you know continue to really think about total rewards compensation how do we how do we respond how do we think about that so those are probably some of the the key ones on my um, wow. top of my list. There's, there's a lot of other things, as you said. <laughs> keeps keeps you busy. How how about you, Marco? After this call, what are you going to do next? What's what's on your uh, desk for the rest of the day or tomorrow? <laughs> we're doing a lot of things. So as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're a company that is going through a transformation, which has been here for a little bit more than five months now. So I think for us is really continuing to hold that north star and really transform the organization. You know, we'll have a change of CEO soon, so that's going to bring uh, a little bit more change uh, into the equation. But I think there, there's something around executing, you know, our strategy and really continue because there's a long way to go in executing that strategy. And that that strategy is also shaping the culture of the organization because it's been a, a lot of change in the last two years. We're very grounded, you know, multinational, but with the core is really here in Portugal and it's a company that's been around for quite a while and that people have a very strong 
perception of us. So we've been through this journey of transformation and we need to continue to stray through to that transformation and, and execute that change. So that's something that, you know, of course, uh, is very impactful on the people team and we are partners on that transformation and we need to, to help the business succeed and, and support the change management exercise that comes with it. In terms of other things, I mean, there's a lot. I just, just before this call, I was, uh, you know, with my team, we're launching our new structure, which is gonna be a fully agile structure, which is really gonna disrupt the way we work and, and the way work gets done within the team. Uh, and obviously that has an implication as well on the business side. So we're looking at a, at a lot of different things, so how we care about our employees and creating a cultural recognition to how we enable this uh, cultural transformation that I mentioned before, how we develop our leaders. Uh, I think it's an area where we haven't done enough to focus mainly on, on the top leadership and we need to look at it at every level and, and across different segments. So that's something that is really key how to improve people's experience along the employee journey. You know, I think here we use the same good tools that are used, uh, you know, with customers and the employee journey mapping and looking at the, the pain points and seeing how we can best address those we actually create. Our, our new organization reflects the, the journey of hire to retire. And then, you know, ways of working. I think for us that that's important as well. I think hybrid worked really well. And we have a, a good balance now. We'll soon move, not soon, next year we'll move into a new office and uh, it will have limited space versus what we have today. So we need to continue to work through hybrid, but guarantee that the experience that people have at the office, it's going to bring something on top of what they experience while they're working from home. And I think that's a very important angle and something that we really need to work hard on and, and pay attention to a lot of important details. Wow. So again, almost nothing there. Huh? Keeps you busy. And uh, I guess maybe it's just a, a nice way just to summarize a little bit this part. It feels that definitely Markel is about ensuring the culture, right, for now and forever. Um, and in the case of Culp, definitely, I think, it, it, uh, Marco, you mentioned several times this concept of transformation. So uh, interesting, right? Uh, how how uh, different viewpoints, different angles on how to move the culture uh, forward. Uh, definitely in the interest of time, and, and both of you mentioned, you know, the war for talent and attraction, retention, and how that's been accelerating, as you also mentioned early on in your case, uh, Marco. Um, this, I guess, is where, uh, to some extent, EVP comes into the picture, right? Um, so what is this thing with the EVP, right? Um, how does an EVP come to play? How does and EVP actually support and assist you in your challenges. The first one I could come up is the one I just mentioned, this idea of uh, hiring, attracting, and retaining. So what's your take on that? Yeah, I think, um, Fernando, you know, it clearly is uh, an important part of that. Um, I, I think as we've talked here, the, um, you know, the, the whole employment relationship, I think, has become a lot more complex than in the past. Um, and I think, you know, with pay and benefits, total rewards just being a part of the equation, really important that we're able to um, accurately, authentically describe what employment here is or at Markel is all about. Um, and I think that is critical from a attracting talent. I think it's also got an important part in terms of retaining talent. We've had a lot of focus on that, that retention piece as well. But I think, you know, making sure that we have um, a, an EVP that really does tie into um, opportunity, development, uh, again, the things that go way beyond, you know, um, your, your paycheck kind of thing in terms of what it means to be a part. And I think, you know, weaving the culture through the EVP is certainly an important part um, for us. Um, and then I think, you know, it's it's about, for us, it's a little bit about consistency as well. We, we're a company that came together through a number of different acquisitions. And I think for a long time, um, you know, if you asked, uh, you had a hiring manager out there, they were probably all describing what being a part of Markel. And they were probably all parts and ingredients, but definitely in very different measure. So I think us now being able to be a little bit more consistent about what that looks like and then playing that through from an onboarding perspective from a development career development perspective. So I think really making sure that we're we're telling our story in a way that is authentic, is honest, um, explains who we are, what we are, 
uh, and what people can expect. So I, I think it is part of that um, and a critical part, as you say, attraction, retention, um, and, and yeah, our, our place. And I think you made the point earlier, for us, it's also important, I think, that it does a better job of describing what a um, a career in insurance can do because I know when I joined Mark Hell people said to me what are you doing going to you know a stodgy old insurance company kind of thing and I tell people my feet have not touched the ground since I got here so I think you know we can also use an EVP to help um, with uh, as well some of the other branding pieces as well but really help sort of explain the excitement and the um, dynamic nature of, of being a part of this uh, this industry and then Mark Hell specifically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. How about you, Marco? What uh, what did EVP mean for a company like Gulf, or even from a, from your previous experience when you were at Deutsche Telekom? Yeah, I think it's absolutely key. Um, I, I think we're far from where Deutsche Telekom was or, or Vodafone, but they've invested heavily in those in those areas. I mean, you know, in that space, and actually, I I, have, I was lucky enough to be there while they're going through those those transformations and. I think it's different from the, the transition that happens within telco where they're positioning themselves more as digital players. I think for us, it's all around this transition from you know where we are today to being a, a green company and you know decarbonization, all of those different things. Because a company like Gulp, of course, especially here in Portugal, people have very strong beliefs about you know the company stable, you know, probably a fairly decent payer and has a, you know, a strong reputation, a strong presence within the country. But as we transform and change, I think we need to, to connect at a different level because a lot of the skills that we want to attract around green talent, so associated with renewables, new energies, they're in high demand. I mean, a lot of companies that are actually only focused on those energies, they are looking for the talent as well. So we need to find a way that we connect emotionally with people so that they understand what life at Gulf means and, and what is the experience of working here. So I would say it does touch, you know, a lot of different po touch points along the, the employee journey. And we need to work on creating, you know, moments that matter along those that journey and, and find a way for people to connect with them and for them to connect with the purpose of your organization at an emotional level, because a rational angle already exists, you know, solid, fairly good pairs, a sad, stable, big organization. But, you know, to attract different types of talent, we need to position ourselves a little bit different. So I think that emotional connection that we need to establish is really key. And also getting people to understand that we are transforming, we're changing and that the gulf of the future is going to be a new and a, and a different company. Invite them to be part of that journey with us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, interesting. You just mentioned two very interesting keywords associated with EVP. And I wrote them down. One is emotion and the other one is experience. Um, and maybe continuing with you, Marco, um, would you say that for a successful EVP, it's important to instill it? with both emotion and experience? Yeah, 100%. I think, as I said, the rational angle already exists. I mean, it's different, right? Because in Portugal, we're very well known. We have, we're one of the biggest companies in the country. In Spain, it's more competitive. So we're not, we don't have the same positioning, you know, in, in people's minds. In Brazil, it's, it's an unknown brand because we, we don't really have B2C, you know, business there. So it, it's kind of different in the different, you know, geographies, but I, I think what is consistent is that, you know, nowadays energy companies are under a lot of fire because they're a big part of the problem of what's happening with the environment. But I also believe, you know, we're a big part of the solution. So we need to tell that story and we need to be true to that story. So internally, the way we work, the way we reward people, the way we develop people, the way we grow people needs to be consistent with that story. So we need to really work in different levels to be able to, you know, create that connection. It's not only at the point where we engage, you know, from an employer brand perspective that we sell a very nice picture when people come into the company, they need to live that experience as well because, or easily they'll they'll just leave. So, and, and we'll have no credibility going forward. So ENPS is really key metric for us and the way we measure that along the employee journey and, and adjusting you know, our proposition, our value proposition to the different types of profiles that we attract and to the different type of generations, I think it's it's really key. I mean, without that, we'll, we'll struggle 
to really get the talent that we need. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting um, to live the experience. Um, how, how, how about you, Sue, as to an EVP? What, what, what do you believe uh, makes up for a good EVP? What are the, uh, the factors that we, everyone listening to this call and they're considering developing one or uh, cons thinking about or changing it, what should they um, have on their minds? I mean, my suggestions for that, um, Fernanda, and as you know, we're kind of like, I, we've sort of had an EVP and we're now working on a kind of a, a complete re, uh, redo sort of thing in terms of that. I mean, I think for me, um, authenticity is going to be really, really important. I think making sure that it is very true to, to who we are. I think obviously looking ideally for some differentiation in there as well, in terms of, you know, what is it that is special about, you um, you know, for us, Markel, and, and what working here um, means. Uh, and and then I do think, and Mark made a great point here, I think this connection um, between EVP and employee experience, I mean, it's all willing to go, to go out there and, and promise and put, you know, glossy brochures together. You know, can you then actually deliver on that? So I think those two things, EVP and employee experience, the, the connection there and the ability to make sure that you are delivering and, and not, um, you know, not, um, describing something in a way that they can't then actually um, tie into to the experience that people are going to have um, when they're with the uh, with the organization. So and then I think we talked a bit about, you know, something that can be consistent. And I think that's, you know, that's an interesting one when you think, I mean, we're a, we're a very global um, organization. And so I think, you know, trying to work through um, an EVP that can be um, appropriate on for a global audience as well and think about that especially when you are trying to tie in those emotional pieces as well how, how does that work in different geographies and, and making sure again that this is relevant um, to those different audiences so i think those would be kind of components uh, that would be important uh, super and, and especially the last thing you said probably that's where the authenticity comes back right because given the globalness you have in all the different places where you operate how how do you still bring that to some degree consistency across and be true and faithful to the different cultural implications in different regions and geographies probably that's where the authenticity of the organization has to come through and through the culture Fantastic, yeah. great. Um, I'm just in, in the interest of time, I'm looking here at uh, my, my, my colleagues, I just want to make sure that we're going to leave sufficient time for some, uh, ho hopefully some uh, lofty uh, Q&A. Uh, but before actually opening up the floor and, and, and continuing this idea of giving advice to whoever is listening to us, um, maybe one the, my final default question for both of you would be, um, for all the HR professionals who are listening in now that might not have made it yet to where you both are, right? That you are the pinnacle of, of your organizations. What advice would you have for them? Given all what we've discussed, all the challenges, all the evolutions, all what's happening, what, what piece of advice would you have for them? Sue? Yeah, I think a um, couple of pieces maybe for, for me. Um, I think the first one is just um, grabbing opportunities. I think, you know, taking the opportunity to always um, learn uh, and be curious, especially learning um, about you know the businesses that we all um, work for. You know, I've been um, very lucky uh, through my career to have the opportunities to um, step out of HR. I've done that a couple of times um, to lead a big transformation project, um, then to actually do a strategy and marketing role. And I would have to say, although they were kind of um, probably ones where I'm like, golly, what are they asking me to do kind of thing? Those are probably developmentally where I have learned the most. Um, and I think have really rounded myself out much more to be a true business leader rather than an HR professional kind of thing. I, I, I bring my HR credentials, but I, you know, have got that broader perspective and you know now my current role I've got um facilities and I've got communications as well as HR and so I get to again see that kind of broader employee experience so I would definitely encourage people to um branch out if and when you get those opportunities and if they don't come looking for you go looking for them um I think that would be uh important and then you know opportunities to travel global has been a huge part of my career and i consider myself very lucky as, a, as an hr person to have had the chance to uh, you know live and work in different uh, countries um, and i think that has again just brought a lot from a cross-cultural understanding and uh, an ability to do that 
And then my final piece would be just a can do attitude. I think that goes um, a very, very long way just to be somebody who you know looks at things and try and always have the, the glass half full. And, uh, you know, we, we can make we can make things work. So I think that's that's been key in my my career as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that. Actually, from the few things you mentioned from the from the different things, the first one, I think it's very interesting. And at least me personally, something that I've actually very much observed over the past few years, or actually probably, uh, I would say almost a decade is how much more strategic the HR role has become. And I think it's exactly what you mentioned at the beginning, that uh, one of the keys to that is have a much better, deeper understanding of the business itself and throwing yourself towards what the business is, right? And I think that really is, is what makes a difference between one sort of HR professional and the other ones, right? How about you, Mark? What do you think? What would you recommend anyone listening in to do tomorrow morning, eight o'clock in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> well, funny enough, I got a similar question Friday when I was in this, this other event. So I would just build a little bit because I think Sue already mentioned some very important points for me. It also, it is about trimming big, right? I think, you know, uh, if, if I hadn't dreamed big in terms of uh, having a responsibility like I, the one I have today, probably I wouldn't be here where I am. And, and that was about also going external, you know, internationally and working and living in different cultures and in different countries. And I think that really broadens you as a professional, but also as a person. I, I think that's really important. So you have, there's a degree of risk, you know, personal risk that you, that you have to take. I always say that, you know, fun is really at the edge of our comfort zones. You have to take that step forward to be able to, to put yourself in a place where you can learn, uh, where you can be in challenging situations because that's kind of develop a lot. So definitely 100% international career, probably the, the best decision I ever took. Um, and I think there's an element as well to continuous learning, really working hard. I mean, it's you have to, to go through different experiences. You really have to, to de dedicate yourself to learning and developing new competences. So it's, it's a never going process. So I think, you know, this focus on long life learning, I think, um, you know, it's, it's really, really important. And finally, having fun. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of times we take everything super seriously and we get frustrated when things don't go our way. And, you know, I think having fun is really an important part of, of everything we do. So you have to enjoy what you do. You really have to have fun with your teams. And in the end of the day, when sometimes I look at, you know, the pictures of things I've done in the past and the moments that I, that I enjoyed the most are those where I had fun and I was together you know, with my team. So for me, that's that's a very important element as well. Yeah, and probably actually the last one you mentioned, which seems that's not so important. At the end of the day, where you're going to have fun is probably you're going to excel, where you're going to convey your passion, your conviction, and that will be contaminating for everyone around you, right? And that's what's going to make everyone better there. So um, yeah, I can definitely uh, play with that. All right, well, um, if it's fine, I think we have some questions. Um, yes, actually, there's one which is specifically directed to you, Sue. Um, that is, um, it, who you mentioned that there is the challenges of making real connections between people in a hundred percent remote environment. I guess during the months uh, of pandemic, actually extended, especially in the U.S. Um, the question goes: What practices or recommendations? Do you have for HR leaders who have these challenges still? How do you make the connections between people who don't sit in, in the hub, who are in the spokes between them? Yeah. No. Thank you, whoever wrote it. I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think you know, certainly, yeah. certainly one that, uh, as you say, uh, Fernando, probably more during the pandemic, we really, you know, when we had everybody out, um, you know, when we really had to focus on. And then now we're at a point where probably about 10% or so of our population are st still fully remote, but pretty much everyone else is in this hybrid. So I think we've kind of like been evolving through. I think in terms of practices, um, I would say, I think it really does... Um, you know, the, the whole communication and staying connected, we really double down on, on communication, um, you know, more um, communication in terms of what was going on with the business. Uh, and we continue to do that and have really opened up a lot of uh, what were previously sort of in person, um, you know, making all of those now virtual. Um, so I think, you know, keeping the communication, um, keeping out in front of, of folks. 
The other piece, I think the manager relationship is absolutely critical. And I think helping and supporting managers to think about how do I manage in a remote situation? You know, what, what can I do from a, and again, you know, manager communication, but what's that right balance of staying connected, giving people the right levels of empowerment? So we actually ran a number of um, training programs for our managers on how to think about um, their management style in a, in a remote uh, situation. Um, and then we also did a version of that, which is more, you know, when you think about hybrid, then we also did training for our employees about how to manage in those situations. Because if you're part of a team where you've got some folks who are fully remote, some are hybrid, maybe some are even now back in the office more full time, you know, just being, I think, very cognizant of and some of it is very practical guidance on you know how to run meetings, how to engage and um, make sure everybody is getting to have their voice heard. I think those have been key, key mm-hmm. aspects of how we've tried to try to address that. Yeah, that's uh, super extensive. Thanks so much. Uh, that's quite interesting because obviously, um, uh, obviously there, there had been virtual communication before the pandemic, but we never had it to the extent we have it now or that we had it during the pandemic. And even the way we interact, the way we look into the screen, the way we express ourselves, literally everything to some extent has changed a bit, right? And uh, even the way we relate to each other. Uh, thanks so much for that answer. And thanks for the question, Guadalupe. Next question. Um, this one is uh, for Marco. Who do you count on to shape your cultures and EVPs? That's a good question. Um, I, I think a lot of you, know, you need to do it with with a lot of different you know people. Of course, with the top management, so they need to be part of that process because they need to feel uh, there's a connection between the way we position ourselves as an employer versus the way. We, you know, we position ourselves as a company. So I think for me, uh, you know, EPP, brand, they're, you know, they're two sides of the same kind. They should be absolutely hand, hand in hand. And, and I think they should be communicated in, in a very consistent way. So having that connection, I think is really important, but then you need to find ways that it resonates, uh, you know, with your employees. So I think understanding across the different, um, you know, segments or populations you have within the organization and testing and and understanding if it speaks to the different generations, if it speaks, you know, to the diversity you have within the business, I think it's really important. So I think, you know, you need to understand uh, what's the view of the top management, but I would say equally importantly, you need to understand what the organization feels and, and how it impacts the diversity that you have, or else then it's going to be something that is really, really nice uh, from a top management perspective, but doesn't really talk to the company, uh, you know, that you are. So I think involving different elements, you know, focus, whatever techniques we want to use, but involving uh, the organization at different levels, it's really key for having a successful EVP. Mm-hmm. Which actually also, to some extent, that connects with what you said also, Sue, before, this idea of the ability of the managers, right? So, yeah, you might want to start the top management because everyone looks up to the top management, but at the end of the day, um, otherwise culture can get lost in the way. And and obviously, I don't want to do your self-promotion of the last report we did on EVP, but one of the findings we had um, was that actually culture was kind of getting lost in the way, right? And maybe this getting lost in the way is how, through all the ranks in the organization that it was just not permeating until the very employee, right? I think that's key, Fernando. I think, you know, when you, when you think about, um, you know, how the how the individual um, experiences the company. So much of that is through their immediate manager, their immediate working team. And so I think the ability to, you know, we really think about our managers as being those kind of, you know, culture champions, stewards of the culture. And really important that as we think about our management curriculum, as we think about leadership development, that that, that really is a, a very strong part of that and we're really trying to help equip them you know and I think as well as companies get larger um, you know how you scale that effectively as well Um, you know across again across geographies across multiple locations um, making sure that those things continue to resonate and I think your point as well keeping and for us certainly you know listening to employees uh, you know during the pandemic it was through pulse surveys I think you know we do a very regular you know major um 
engagement survey that we have sort of we've done for eight years or so. So we have a really good track on what's happening. So really trying to stay connected in that way as well. And, you know, seeing if there are gaps emerging or if we're starting to see any fraying um, or, and that we can then address. So I think that is key. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Marco, anything to add on that one, on that front? I just want to say that leadership is really key. So I think, as I said before, you need to, to reach the organization at, at multiple levels and, and make sure that you have a very diverse um, you know, view when defining your EVP, but the role of the leaders, as Sue was mentioning, is absolutely key. Um, you know, Usually people leave leaders, they don't leave companies. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, with those populations to really uh, making sure that they connect uh, with their teams, that they are focused on their growth and development, because those are ways that then can translate into how attractive it can be to other people, because these people talk with other people, right? They talk with their friends, they talk. Uh, and I think this kind of peer-to-peer -peer element is, is really important. That will only happen if they really genuinely feel uh, that, you know, the company cares about them and that their leaders definitely care about them. So I think the leadership layer is, is fundamental on this process. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, actually, I'm getting here another question, and this one is directed to Sue, starting off. Um, you talked about the importance of listening in order to be flexible and understanding. What are the best ways to listen to employees? Are there any new techniques? Actually, it's a question for both of you. So it might be interesting to get your perspectives on both. What does listening mean? How do you listen? I mean, is it just walking around the floor and just listen, right? I mean, obviously not, but or also, um, how, do you, how do you handle that? How do, yeah. how do you work across the organization of listening? I, I think there are multiple layers of that, Fernando, as you just said. I, I do think, um, you know, managers being, you know, open door policy, um, you know, open phone policy, open Zoom policy, whatever it might be. I think, you know, being very open to um, listen. We actually just, you know, as, as everything is opening up, you know, we're out now, we're doing, we were in a leadership transition. So we're doing town halls and those have, you know, Q&A sessions with our um, co-CEO, president, myself, you know, we, we just are out there. Um, we, we tack a social onto as many of those as we can. So people have the chance not to, if they don't want to ask a question in a big forum, then they can do that uh, much more one-on-one, -on -one, um, which I think those are, are important. And then I think, you know, complementing that, with you know we do pulse surveys we do the enps we do a, say a more formal um survey and we've also started to do some of these sort of virtual focus groups i mean we used to do focus group focus group, fo you know in-person focus groups but starting to do virtual focus groups we've done that in a couple of dni topics and um, we're going to use those for um some of our total rewards uh, pieces as well. So I think, you know, the chance for people again to, to really share their thoughts. So I think there's multiple different ways. Um, I think you also have to be careful that you don't overdo it. The, there was one point I have to say during COVID, we were we were pulsing like every couple of weeks and, you know, we got feedback, hang on a minute, I haven't got anything new to say. So we, we definitely ratchet. So That's work. I think, I think you have to listen to make sure you're not listening too much or asking too much. Um, mm -hmm. But I think also being responsive and, you know, when you are listening and you are hearing things, um, making sure that people see you do something with it. It's all well and good to, to get input, but how are we responding? So um, certainly on our engagement survey, we always try and pull out, OK, what are the key themes and then what actions are we going to take and, and making sure we've got some specific um, follow up on that. I think that's that's key. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't really, you know, if you're not valuing the um, feedback and the input you're getting, then I think, you know, people will start to close down. So I think that's that's key as well. Well, there was a lot of um, insights there. Uh, Marco, from your experience, how what's the best tips on really listening in an organization? I think Sue mentioned, mentioned some of the techniques. I think there's an element around survey fatigue that you have to to think about and, and you can also introduce technology. I think there are some good tools nowadays that you can use to kind of measure um, the pulse of the company and hear the, the voice of your employees. And some of them actually are the same tools that you can use to get the voice of your customer. So if you have some of those systems, they can actually work in an integrated manner, which I think has a lot of value because they are connected, right? So, you know, the way your people, um, you know, leave the company, the, all the engagement they have has an impact on 
how how much they they manage to engage your customers. So actually, if you have the opportunity to integrate both, I think that's that's really cool. There's good technology out there. There's always on service. There's you know applications that can try to measure that through continuous questions. I, I think it's finding a balance between you know really getting uh, a pulse of how your organization is feeling at a moment in time versus not you know overdoing it and, and getting people tired and fatigued of responding to service you have to find your sweet spot uh, mm -hmm. and i think there's a lot of good technology out there that can really help you do that mm -hmm. super thanks very very insightful also i think we have an additional question that came in um this time from olympia um and says could you talk more about allowing employees to feel valued, how you recognize performance and the tension between recognizing the individual versus the collective? Oh, well, that's an interesting take. Who wants to go first on that one? I can go maybe on that one. So actually, uh, I've just uh, delivered to my team some of our Grow Awards in the session that we had today. And Grow is a platform that, that we launched a few months ago, which is all around creating a, a recognition culture. So we started with some you know, specific monetary awards that are based on you know, outstanding deliverables. So Grow stays for you know, great recognition of outstanding work. And I think it's really important that you create a culture where people feel recognized. There's criteria you can either recognize individual or collective achievements. I think you know, it really depends on the culture that you create, right? I think you can do both. You can recognize people individually and you can recognize them collectively. And I think the way that's perceived within the organization is really related to the culture that you have as a company, right? I think sometimes companies might want to go extreme and they're only, you know, collective recognition. We don't believe in individual recognition, but that's not actually what happens in reality. Sometimes individuals do have a significant impact that deserves to be recognized. So I think if you're very clear on what you're recognizing, what are the criteria, what are the behaviors, because it's not only about the deliverables, it's also about the how, so how people deliver that work. Uh, and I think if that's really aligned with your purpose and uh, you know with um, who you are as a company, I think people will, will understand. But you need, you know, for me, the most important thing is you need to be true to your culture. And you need to have transparency in the way that you do these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super. Uh, Sue. Yeah, I, I would, um, I think Marco um, hit it exactly right. I think getting the balance right of that individual and collective, I know that's something that we work quite hard at. So we'll do a sort of, you know, we do global employee appreciation events. Um, we do more individual when we actually link ours back to that culture, our Markel style. So we have a style award and, you know, individuals are nominated actually by their their peers. So it's an employee nomination that then rolls up and eventually, you know, recognize those folks at our, at our shareholders meeting. So as real sort of exemplars of the of the culture. Um, and then, you know, we do the, the spot awards, we do shout outs for either teams or individuals at our sort of quarterly um, global communications meeting. So I think finding different ways to do that, you know, parts of our business, um, they, they do some different things in terms of some gamification and kind of like um you know almost like um you know earning various um recognitions and rewards and pieces so it i think you're right marco that kind of um what fits for the business and the culture um is really important so we, we've definitely got some different things going on but you know, continue to just say to managers this is so important you know recognizing um rewarding um is is critical so various different ways of going at that Mm. And actually, uh, thanks so much for that addition. And just what both of you just commented actually brings me to my last question, which I think is given that we have a couple of minutes left and is aligned with what you were saying, this idea of the alignment uh, between the culture and the performance and how actually you reward that performance. Going back to EVP, I think maybe another interesting thing now could be interesting for our listeners is what are the misconceptions around EVP? Like, we, we understand what an EVP is, right? And, and we have a broad understanding and how actually to make it happen, the challenges associated with it. Um, what, what do people get wrong about what it's not? Like, what are the misconceptions of EVP? Marco. 
I mean, sometimes you think it's like an HR thing, um, which I think is the number one misconception. It's not it. It's about the company. And that's why I said before that it's so important that the, you know, the, um, the way we position ourselves or any company positions themselves as an employer and as a product or as a service, I think it's really important because a lot of times, you know, potential future employees are our customers as well and they develop a perception. So I, I think, of course, it's not a marketing mechanism because you need to be true to your values and, and you need to, you know, share and, and communicate an experience that is real and it, it's, it's how it's going to feel like when people are in the organization but I think it's it's a great tool for an organization to connect uh, with society I think it's a great way uh, to communicate the values of the company and I think if, if it's really well articulated with the corporate brand I think it can really have have a lot of impact but it's not a you know it's not an HR thing it is mm. it's something that is key for the business and I think sometimes that's a bit of a misconception where people feel like oh that's an HR okay. thing and then we are a brand and they are employer brand and as I said before it's you know the two sides of the same coin. Oh, fantastic yeah I, I, I love that. Sue what about you? Yeah, I mean, I would completely agree with Marco. I think, you know, making sure that it is seen that this is something that's, you know, that it's it's the company, it is the whole collective that, that owns this, um, I think is important. Um, I think the point, you know, that it, it's not an advert, it's something that you have to be able to absolutely deliver on. Um, and then I think also that it's not a silver bullet. Um, this is not going to this is not going to solve all those challenges that we talked about earlier, uh, Fernando. It's a really important piece of the puzzle um, that is talent, that is organization, that is culture. But it's uh, it's just one component part. So I think not lulling yourself into this being the um, the answer to everything. Yeah, excellent. Fantastic. So we are uh, one minute over time. Um, so um, I don't know if we have time for one more question. Just want to be respectful of your time. Um, yeah, so, oh, we have one question from Julian. How's that? Let me uh, read this. Because you're speaking about gathering info and understanding users, I was wondering how they telegraph changes and rerouting of strategy in a way that also communicates how feedback is addressed for users. Goals and changes are often not perceived from the bottom up. Okay, that's um, so. I, I guess probably a way we could uh, summarize it is um, all the information that actually gets to let's call them the users. How 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 can we ensure that those changes from the bottom up then actually you know if there is a change of strategy or there's a change of action, how to make them actually gain traction for it? That's how I am interpreting the question. Any thoughts on that? I think that's kind of it. Now go ahead. Sue. Oh, you can go, Marco. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I was going to say, I think that's the internal angle of the, of the UMP, and that is very linked to change management, which is, you know, how do you communicate internally? I think sometimes companies make the mistake of focusing a lot externally and creating a lot of cool campaigns and doing a lot of stuff, but then not really caring about the people they already have within the organization. So whenever you make significant changes or even in your, you know, regular performance management cycles, you need to be able to articulate really the goals of the organization, how they connect with people's individual work. And I think you can do that through, through many ways. But for me, that's really around the importance of change management, right? Of understanding how these kind of big strategic concepts and you know the vision you have as, as an organization resonates with your people and how you can bring to life examples of how in their daily work, they impact that strategy through the things that they do. And I think if you're successful doing that, then people will more, will more easily understand the importance and the impact they have within the organization. They will feel more connected when they feel like their work is valid and has an impact in the broader company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super, thanks, Sue. Yeah. I think my, my only add to that, I think, you know, when you go out there and you ask for sort of um, feedback, I think really um, making sure that people understand what you are doing with it. So I think there's a communication piece. And then similarly, I think, you know, when you are um, certainly introducing new sort of strategic direction, I mean, we really kind of double down on that 
again, multi-channeled communication to make sure that really is, you know, it's not just the the one corporate email, it's, you know, how do we, the face-to-face, the the virtual town halls, the different ways of really doing things. So I think that telegraphing, it, it's kind of like, what are all the different ways that we can make sure that um, that information um, gets into the organization, gets into the ecosystem um, and does so in a way that people you know, to the point here, can understand what their part of this is. How do I play a part in in that? So I think that's that's also key. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. All right. Well, actually, the time flew by because sorry to tell you this, I have another thirty questions. No, never mind. <laughs> Obviously, the time is by. And I sometimes I joke around the office like if I would again restart my career, I'd probably maybe go into HR because I think it's absolutely fascinating and it's probably the most exciting. Um, place to be in any organization nowadays. That's just my personal view. Having said that, wanted to thank you, thank you, thank you, as we say here at Saffron three times, very much to both Yusu and Marco for taking the time in your extremely busy schedules, a few, as you have been uh, uh, sharing with us, uh, for participating, your fantastic insights. Hope it's been extremely also interesting for the ones listening in. Also to the audience, thanks so much for taking the time. Hope it was uh, valuable and that you got some gold nuggets from these two amazing HR professionals. And with that, thanks so much and looking forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.